Hello and welcome to this series of tutorials developed by the Humanitarian Environmental Network, the REH. The purpose of these videos is to introduce you to the NIP+, an environmental impact assessment tool. In this first video, we will present the context that created the need for a tool to assess the environmental impact of humanitarian projects. We will discuss the global context of the ecological crisis, as well as the responses implemented by humanitarian actors. A second video will then be dedicated to a presentation of the tool, its principles, and how it works. The third video will guide you to using the tool step by step, and finally, a fourth video will provide some keys to using and interpreting the NEED Plus results. So let's begin with some details on the context of the tool. As you know, we're experiencing an ecological crisis that is manifested in particular by an increase in the number of extreme climatic events of all types. And this is what is represented on this graph. When we talk about climatic events, that covers episodes of extreme temperatures, as in the case of heat waves or droughts. Um, and those are some of the events that are becoming increasingly frequent in addition to hydraulic events like floods. You have to keep in mind that global warming refers to an increase in the average global temperatures that is manifested locally by more extreme temperature variation as well as climatic events. Looking at a country's context helps us understand its local vulnerabilities in the face of a change in climate. And this is what this infographic shows about Bangladesh. As we see, the country should be most affected by a raise in temperatures all year round, as well as uh, more extreme climatic events and floods and raising sea levels. So, of course, having more frequent natural disasters and a rise in temperatures is going to impact our operations as humanitarians because it will create or exacerbate some needs and it might complicate some existing operations. But our work is not just affected by the environmental crisis. To some extent, it can also contribute to this crisis. The chart that you can see shows the main drivers of the environmental crisis. The work from the IPBES, which is the group of experts working on environmental change, have broken down the drivers of this specific environmental crisis. And this is going to allow us to understand how some of our actions can lead to environmental destruction. One of the first drivers is the change in land use. And this is what we do when we build, for example, a clinic uh, on a land that was usually uh, used for something else. Uh, same when we build some storage units or if we promote agriculture on lands that were unused uh, before that. Another important factor of the environmental crisis is the direct exportation of resources, uh, which is what we would be doing when we drill, for example, to build a well, as this uh, specific drill is propelled by engines that require a lot of oil and so will have a big impact on this resource. We can also mention pollution. And obviously, to some extent, we are aware that we are uh, causing pollution when using jeeps or planes to travel. But we can also mention the microplastic pollution that are going to be generated by the tires on the car. So when the tires are in contact with the road, uh, they're going to leave behind some uh, micro bits of plastic. And this is why they wear down. And we can also mention some kinds of pollution that are a bit more specific to the sector like in the case of medical waste. Now we can decompose all the events that are going to be manifesting this double crisis to understand whether they are linked more directly to the climate or to the environment. To clarify this distinction between the climate and the environment, when we talk about climate again, what we refer to is this uh, global increase in temperatures and all the local events that are related to this uh, change in climate. However, when we mention the environment, what we refer to is the loss of biodiversity and how ecosystems are affected, destroyed, transformed. 
Now, obviously, those two crises are linked, and the consequences of one crisis can become the driver of another, so you can always see them as a whole, but by separating them, we can build the appropriate tools to understand them and reduce our impact. When we talk about reducing the impact, the idea is that there are several approaches that we can adopt uh, towards this double crisis. First, we can try to adapt, and that is to say, observe the consequences of a crisis and find a way to live with them. This is what we do when we promote the use of seeds that are more resistant to drought. We're adapting to this consequence of um, climate change. The same way, when we change the architecture used in buildings to be more resistant to flood, we're adapting to climate change. Generally, it's something that we're quite used to, um, thanks to the very active disaster and risk reduction work that is already present in a lot of actors of the sector. And we can also, in a complementary way, try to mitigate the crisis by reducing its causes. So, for example, when we try to limit the um, greenhouse gas emissions with renewable and less emitting electricity sources like solar panels, or by limiting emissions, uh, like in the case of this improved fireplace. A different way to mitigate climate change is to limit the water leaks that are present in urban systems, as is being presented in this picture, as you then reduce the energy that was wasted to pump the water uh, that will never be used. On the other hand, we can't adapt to the environmental crisis. Once a lake is filled with oil, every living thing within it uh, will die or, or deplete. So we can't go back to this former state as if uh, nothing had happened. What we can do instead, uh, the closest thing would be restoration, which is where we try to get back to an ecological state that is going to be as close as possible to what was happening before. For example, if we reintroduce some species, uh, some populations that we protect. However, what we can do uh, has to do with mitigation. That's what we can do when we implement some waste management measures, whether it is because we use some uh, incinerators like in the first picture or with waste collection like it's being done with the motorcycles in the last picture. In the same way, we're mitigating the environmental crisis when we try to limit our use of pesticides and of any products that could harm biodiversity, the wildlife, the soils uh, within our agricultural projects. The point of this framework for adaptation and mitigation is that our capacity of response is not going to be as affected by each event when we put in practice reduction measures, like in this graph. So this is the general framework of what is happening in the world and how we can deal with it. But more specifically in the humanitarian sector, there are also much more concrete motivations that drive us to change the way we work, and in particular, uh, that motivate us to know and to limit our environmental impact. One of these motivations is that donors are becoming increasingly aware of environmental issues and committed to reducing the impact of operations that they fund. It's the case in particular with ECHO. ECHO introduces minimal requirements and suggests transversal recommendations that should be applied to the whole project. One notable requirement is the analysis of environmental risks, as well as waste management measures taken across the project. ECHO's environmental policy also introduces some requirements that are specific to each sector. In the case of wash and shelter, those include, again, an environmental evaluation where the use of the need plus is suggested as well as an environmental report, which includes mitigation measures to be sent along with the project proposal. Some of the requirements are also a bit more technical, with, for example, a ban on water trucking in most cases, as well as measures to save water. The environmental policy includes recommendations that are not required, but that ensure the quality of your project 
uh, in the case of WASH, um, they suggest groundwater monitoring systems. In the food security sector, the supply chain can be targeted to limit both uh, transportation and waste. There is also a focus on the pollution associated with cooking means. In terms of recommendations, we can mention the systematic use of compost. The requirements about the livelihood sector have to do with job creation around environmental issues as well as natural resources management. ECHO also recommends to give some attention to the source of the energy provided to the local actors that you will be supporting. Now, of course, all of this is not an exhaustive list, and you're encouraged to take a look at the documents that best fit your activities. And ECHO is not the only donor that has specified some precise recommendations. GAC, for example, already had a set of requirements that was quite precise, but that wasn't necessarily already followed through, which is now becoming increasingly the case. And it is quite likely that this type of requirements will become increasingly standard. So this requirements of um, reducing our impacts is external because it is encouraged and controlled by the donors, but it's also something internal to the sector as it builds on the principle of do no harm. Obviously, to avoid harming the population that you work with, you have to make sure that you're not going to damage their resources that they rely on and the state of the environments where they live. And you might remember in particular that the sphere standards mentioned the environmental impacts on a few occasions in the list of their minimal requirements, both in terms of uh, areas and in terms of resources. We can see in particular that they recommend a rapid environmental impact assessment as a minimal standard. Within this framework of assessing and reducing our impacts on the environment, a working group of humanitarian organizations was created under the leadership of the Humanitarian Environmental Network. It is mostly active around building the capacity to use the need on participating in the improvements of the tool and making sure that the user feedback is taken into account. But it is not restricted to the need plus as it also continues to look for other environmental assessment tools that can be relevant to its members. And now that you have a better idea of why the tool can be used, I'll let you start on the second part of the training, which is going to give you a bit more about how to use it.